I just learned Discover credit cards do something pretty awesome. At the end of your first year, they automatically double all the cash back you've earned. That's right. Everything you earned doubled. All the cash back from eating at your favorite soup dumpling restaurant doubled. All the cash back from that trip you sort of learned how to snowboard also doubled. And the best part, you don't have to do anything ridiculous to get it. Nope, Discover does it automatically. Seriously, though, see terms and check it out for yourself at discover.com slash match. Today on Something You Should Know, one way to make food taste better that has nothing to do with the food. Then, what it takes to be mentally tough and why a little self-doubt makes you even tougher. It's okay to have some self-doubt. You don't have to believe everything that you think. We know that, say, students who have a little self-doubt tend to study harder. Or an athlete with a little self-doubt keeps their head in the game longer and they actually tend to perform better. Also, how to be better at remembering people's names. And it's really easy. And why we sometimes mispronounce words, like the word orangutan. Most people say orangutan. They add the G at the end. There's no G at the end. But English likes what are called reduplicates, ding-dong, flip-flop. Same thing with yin-yang. It's not, a lot of people say yin-yang, but it's not, it's yin-yang. All this today on Something You Should Know. If you own a small business, you know the value of time. Innovation Refunds does too. They've made it easy, no matter how busy you are, to apply for the Employee Retention Credit, or ERC. Go to GetRefunds.com to get started, and in less than eight minutes, see if your business qualifies for ERC assistance. Your business may be eligible for a payroll tax refund of up to $26,000 per employee kept on payroll during COVID-19. Innovation Refunds has already helped clients claim over $3 billion in payroll tax refunds through the ERC, and they may be able to help your business too. There's no upfront charge either. They don't get paid until your business gets its refund. Many businesses believe they won't qualify based off incomplete or outdated information, so don't let this opportunity pass you by. Because this payroll tax refund is only available for a limited time. Go to GetRefunds.com. That's GetRefunds.com. Something you should know. Fascinating intel. The world's top experts. And practical advice you can use in your life. Today, Something You Should Know with Mike Carruthers. Hi, welcome to Something You Should Know. We start today with something that any cook will find interesting, particularly if you're like a mediocre cook. It turns out that the weight of your dishes can affect the taste of the food. A study found that food served on heavier plates or in heavier bowls and beverages sipped from heavier glasses taste better. People naturally associate heavier plates with better made luxury items. The same proved true for flatware. Volunteers scored the food they ate from heavier spoons and forks as much tastier than the exact same food eaten with plastic or lightweight utensils. And that is something you should know. Would you say you're mentally strong? In your head, are you able to handle the the slings and arrows that life hurls your way? And are you able to take advantage of opportunities and situations because you feel you you have it all together, you're mentally tough? Could you maybe use a little more of that mental toughness? Well, here to give you some is Amy Morin. She is a licensed clinical social worker and psychotherapist, and she has a TED Talk on the topic of mental toughness, and it is one of the most watched TED Talks of all time. Over 22 million views. She's the author of a book called 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. Hi, Amy. Welcome to Something You Should Know. Thank you so much for having me. So what does it mean to have mental strength? And what does it mean to not have mental strength? I mean, what what do those two things look like? Oh, I'm glad you asked. So mental strength, there's three parts to it. The way you think, the way you feel, and the way you behave. So the thinking part is really about, do you believe everything that you think? Do you uh, trust the self-doubt that runs through your head? Do you question everything? Do you ruminate on things? 
those kinds of things will keep you from being mentally strong. The emotional part is really about knowing how to manage your emotions. That's not to say that you have to be happy all the time, but when you get in a bad mood, are you able to turn things around? Or if you're anxious and it's not serving you well, can you manage your anxiety in a healthy way? And then the behavioral component is about taking some kind of action. So it might be, you know, I'm tired today, but I'm going to push myself to go to the gym anyway. Or maybe it feels really scary to get up and give a speech in front of a room full of people, but the most helpful action is to get up and do it anyway. So you're able to push yourself even when you don't feel like doing something, if it's going to lead to the best possible outcome. And when we lack mental strength, we struggle with lots of things in life, everything from our relationships to our ability to get things done, to work. And we get stuck in a dark place and we have trouble digging ourselves out. And then when adversity strikes, it often reduces us to pretty much nothing. And it's hard to get over challenges and it's hard to work through pain. And we just tend to stay stuck in life. The strength, this mental strength that some people seemingly have and other people don't have, is it because why is it? Why is why do some of us have it and some of us don't? Part of it is what we're born with. Certainly our personality plays a role, genetics. Our life experiences also play a role. If you had an easy childhood compared to lots of challenges that you overcame. And the rest of it, though, is the choices that we make, sort of like physical strength. You can go to the gym, you can lift weights, and you can choose to become strong. Mental strength is the same. No matter what kind of hand you were dealt in life, you still have options of how you're going to spend your time, who you're going to spend it with, and what sort of goals you want to achieve. When you look at people who lack this mental toughness that that you describe, can you look at their life and say, well, they've been you know beaten down so many times, that's why they have it, or it, or some of them have it, or is it more it's in your head more than it's in your life? Well, that's the thing. A lot of times people ask me to identify celebrities who are mentally strong or athletes. But, you know, I don't I don't know. I don't know what their internal struggles are. I don't know what battles people are overcoming, what sort of struggles they have. And as a therapist, I happen to know that everybody's battling something. And from the outside, you would probably never know it. And that's why sometimes we see people that have these secret lives. You see a an athlete who does really well on the court, they have tons of self-discipline, and then you find out they are also struggling with a gambling addiction. So you don't always know based on the outside of what you see from somebody, but we do know that overcoming challenges successfully is one of those things that helps us become stronger. So sometimes people who go through a rough childhood might emerge saying, you know, I'm stronger and, and better because of the things I overcame, because it taught me that I'm able to do things I might not have otherwise thought I could do. Is that a variation on the idea of whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger? Because I've never thought much of that. I, I actually don't like that saying because I think it makes us think, well, if I went through something tough and I come out scarred, then somehow there's something wrong with me. <laughs> and we know a lot of people go through difficult times and they're traumatized. And that doesn't mean that they are flawed in any way. It just means that, yeah, sometimes things do help us and we grow from it. We know there's something called post-traumatic growth, which people say that tough thing that I went through actually enhanced my life in some strange, unexpected way. But we know that many people go through tough times and they come out from it and they say, you know, gosh, I now struggle. I have nightmares. I am no longer the same person I am or I feel really jumpy. I'm anxious. Doesn't mean that they were weak. So it's important to note that, yeah, some tension is needed to probably help us become our best selves. But on the other hand, we don't need to like put ourselves in harm's way just to try to toughen ourselves up. Sometimes I think we assume people who have been through tough things are are going to be always be able to rise to the occasion and that makes them a better person. And then they feel that pressure to make it look like they have it all together. We see this with say combat veterans when they're struggling so much on the inside, but they don't dare verbalize it because they're afraid that looks like weakness. So let's go back to the the things that you say, the elements that you mentioned at the very beginning here uh, and, and talk about them one by one. So what was the first one? It has to do with the way that you think and knowing that everything you think isn't necessarily true and you can talk back to those negative thoughts that you have to develop a more helpful inner dialogue. And give me an example of that. Let's take self-doubt, for example. So 
when we look around, let's say you're about to run a race, you look around at everybody else at the starting line and you might think, gosh, these people are more confident than I am. They look like they're going to like they can run really fast. I can't do this. I'm going to embarrass myself. We know that those kinds of thoughts will affect your performance. When you are there and your goal is to just not embarrass yourself, you'll perform much worse than if you say, I'm here to do my very best. And this is true in with athletes, with somebody who's going to deliver a speech, somebody who's on a sales call. The thoughts that you have can make a huge difference. But that's not to say we should eliminate all self-doubt. Sometimes people will say, well, if I'm struggling and I'm questioning whether I can do something, then it must mean I don't belong. That's not true either. We know that, say, students who have a little self-doubt tend to study harder. Or an athlete with a little self-doubt keeps their head in the game longer and they actually tend to perform better. So the key is really knowing that it's okay to have some self-doubt. You don't have to believe everything that you think, but that also you can have a conversation with yourself that's helpful, kind of like the same way you might talk to a friend when you're giving them a pep talk. Self-compassion plays a huge role in our performance, as does all the ways that our inner dialogue sort of convinces us to behave or the actions that it takes. So you don't have to get rid of all your negative thoughts. You just have to know how do you talk back to those negative thoughts in a helpful way. So you don't have to believe everything you think. See, I mean, that sounds great, but how do you, if, <laughs> if you're thinking it, you obviously must believe it. So how do you think it and not believe it? You can distance yourself from your brain a bit. So when your brain tells you that you don't belong, that you're not going to do a good job, that you've just humiliated yourself, sometimes just recognizing, is this a true thought or is this just my brain's exaggerating again? And when I work with people who struggle with a specific issue, somebody who has an anxiety disorder, they tend to always think about the worst case scenarios. They exaggerate things in their minds. They tend to dwell on the one time that they messed up as opposed to the nine times they did a good job. So just externalizing it a little bit, saying, okay, the anxiety is making my brain focus on the negative right now. So just because that's running through my head doesn't make it true. And sometimes people will purposely look for the evidence to the contrary. So if your brain tells you, you are the worst person in the room, come up with three ideas that say, no, actually, here's times when I actually did something really well, or here's three things I've done in my life that's proof that I am smart sometimes, or I am good enough sometimes. And when we look for those exceptions to the rule, it can remind ourselves that everything our brain thinks isn't true. Our brain often goes for the all or nothing kind of thinking. We're either the best at something or the worst at it, or we're horrible at at a certain area of our lives and a genius in another area. So just reminding yourself that there's exceptions to the rule can really help balance that out a bit. It also seems, just from thinking of my life experience, that those moments when you start to tell yourself, I don't belong here, these people are going to do this much better than me, I, I'm going to screw this up, they're, they're typically new experiences, they're not things you've likely done before or been in quite in this situation. Like if you had two or three times to do it, by the third time you, you, you would feel more confident, but it's that newness, that strangeness of the situation that makes you start to think, I don't belong here. That's just it. And it's the the emotional piece. We get uncomfortable, we get nervous. And when we start to feel those feelings, it fuels all of those thoughts that tell us, yeah, I can't do this. And it tries to talk you out of doing it. Your brain wants you to be in a comfortable place. Your brain doesn't want you to take a risk. It doesn't want you to embarrass yourself. It doesn't want you to put yourself out there knowing that you might fail. So it'll try to talk you out of it and say, eh, maybe you shouldn't do this. So remembering to do what you just described you should do is probably the hardest thing to do because all those thoughts are screaming at you of what a loser you are. And for you to just tell yourself, no, I'm not a loser in, in the face of all those screaming thoughts seems like a hard and somewhat ineffective thing to do. It is. And fortunately, though, we can test it on a daily basis. So it might be you just start doing some physical exercise. Like maybe you say, I'm going to do some push-ups. Maybe after three push-ups, your brain says, okay, getting tired here. Can't do this any longer. It might tell you you can't do a fourth push-up or it might tell you that you should give up or your arms are going to be so tired tomorrow that you can't keep going. And the trick is you keep going a little bit longer than your brain tells you that you can. 
And it's a, just a really effective way to teach yourself that your brain underestimates you, that it will tell you that you're not capable of doing something. And it's kind of a tangible way to say, you know, my brain told me to give up after three push-ups, but I was able to do six. And it just reminds you that you can keep going even when your brain tells you not to. And if you start incorporating more of those things into your daily life where you test those thoughts, then it serves you well in the bigger cases when you face a bigger challenge where maybe you're thinking, oh, I don't know about this. Then you remind yourself, okay, my brain underestimates me. I'm going to do it anyway. Our topic is mental strength, mental toughness, and how to get more of it. And I'm speaking with Amy Morin. She is a psychotherapist and author of the book, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. As if the McCrispy couldn't get any better, Bacon and Ranch just entered the chat. The Bacon Ranch McCrispy. Available at participating McDonald's for a limited time. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Okay, Amy, so let's move on to the next part after the you don't have to believe everything you think. So then there's the emotional piece. And most of us weren't really taught much about our feelings. How do you deal with feelings? How do you recognize them? And although we do talk about emotional intelligence... I don't think we're there yet. You know, if I'm giving a speech to a room full of high level executives and I give them 30 seconds to write down all the feeling words that they know, typically they come up with about five in 30 seconds. Once we get beyond, say, happy, sad, mad, people start to kind of run out of ideas. Like, what else are there for feelings? So we don't know. How do you recognize your feelings? How do you manage them in a healthy way? And mental strength is about knowing it's okay to feel a whole range of emotions, but you don't have to stay stuck in the ones that aren't serving you well. And next? The other part of that is, is then figuring out our behavior. So if you feel anxious about something, your anxiety might try to talk you out of it. And so if you can put a name to that, say, okay, this is anxiety. It's trying to talk me out of making this sales call. I'm going to do it anyway. And just putting a name to that emotion helps. So if you name it as anxiety and then figure out, is this helping or hurting? Obviously, you want your anxiety to talk you out of doing something dangerous. If your friend tells you to go jump off a bridge, you want your anxiety to kick in. So it's about asking, is this helpful or hurtful? And if you find, you know, it really would serve me well to try to make this sales call or to get up and give this speech in front of all these people to say, what can I do to talk myself into that so I can take that positive action? And so often our behavior really reinforces whatever it is we're feeling. So when we're sad, we might sit home on the couch and isolate ourselves. Or when we're anxious, we pace and we don't do things that would maybe solve the problem. We tend to avoid it. So it's really about asking yourself, like, what action could I take right now that would be helpful to this? So it might be facing a fear. It might be stepping back sometimes and taking care of yourself, but just knowing I have choices. I don't have to feel like going to the gym, but I can push myself to do it anyway. Which of your 13 things do you find people struggle with the most? I think it's not giving away their power. And this is one I could speak to in my own life too. So often we'll blame other people for stuff like, God, my mom makes me feel bad about myself or my boss makes me work late. And taking back your power is really about saying, you know, what? I'm in control of how I think, how I feel and how I behave, like no matter what. You're in control of your day, how you spend your time and who you spend it with. But it's so easy to lose sight of that. And even in my own life, I'll still find myself saying things like, oh, I have to go to the grocery store. Well, I don't have to go to the grocery store. It's a choice. And if I don't go, maybe I don't have the ingredients for something I'm going to make for dinner, but that's OK. And when we take back our power, it's just about recognizing those choices. Like, I don't have to hang out with people I don't want to. Nobody's stealing my time. Nobody's wasting my time. It's really up to me to make those decisions. And when I feel like people are taking away my power, it's just a sign I should probably set some different boundaries in my life. And then when I do that, I feel more empowered to say, you know, I am in control of my life. Talk about um, dealing with failure, because I think that really stops a lot of people, that they, they try something, it didn't work out, and that's the end of that. And, well, maybe it shouldn't be. That's just it. For a lot of people, fa failure is embarrassing or it feels like it's the absolute end of the road. Like, well, I tried to launch a business, it didn't work out, so therefore my conclusion is I'm not a good business owner. 
And we see in today's world so many successful people, but we usually just see their success. We don't see the 15 times that they failed along the way. And people don't really talk about failure until they've succeeded. So it's easy to say, well, I launched 10 websites before I started this whole giant social media site that's super popular and I'm really successful now. It's much tougher to say, gee, I've failed twice and I'm trying again for the third time and I don't know if it's going to work out yet. But when we give up after failure, it just really affects who we think we are when we think, oh, I'm not the kind of person who is able to pass math class. I'm not the kind of person who is able to launch a business or to be successful in certain areas of our lives. But when we face it in a different way, when we just remind ourselves like, okay, failure feels bad, but I can handle feeling bad. And it's not the end of the world. It gives you this new sense of courage where you can say, all right, I'm, I'm willing to try again. And if I move forward, I now have more knowledge than I had the last time that I tried. You know what I'm wondering is, or a question I have, is how tough is this to change to get to what you're talking about if you're, if you're not there? I mean, if, what's the success rate? It, just, it seems like so much of this is personality and who you are, and to, to try to change seems like a, a, seems like a lot of heavy lifting. Change is definitely tough, but it's worth it the harder you have to work to make something happen, sometimes the better it feels when you finally get there. So when I always talk to people like, we're not going to be perfect. We all make mistakes. And this list of the 13 things mentally strong people don't do for honest, we all do them sometimes no matter what. And it's easy sometimes when life is going well to say, yeah, I don't feel sorry for myself. But then when you're going through a really rough patch, it's much more difficult to, to not do those things. So I think it's important to be on guard, to know that we're always a work in progress. There's always things we can do, but sometimes just little changes every day make a huge difference from saying, I'm going to practice gratitude to I'm going to start naming my feelings to I'm going to set healthy boundaries in my life. Little things can make a huge difference in our overall mental strength. Have you ever come across, because people come to you when they're having trouble with this, but have you ever met or are you one of those people who just like do this naturally? They're just mentally strong, tough people. Well, you know, I encounter a lot of people who who act tough <laughs> on the outside, who feel like if I put up this tough exterior and I pretend like nothing bothers me, then people will think I'm strong. But real strength is about being vulnerable and being able to say, gosh, I struggle with these things. I'm having a hard time talking about feelings and, and asking for help. And so I think that that misconception causes a lot of people to think I'm, I'm so tough, nothing can bother me. But the strongest people I've ever met are the ones who say, you know, gosh, I'm struggling with this. I'm having a hard time. And and some of them have even uh, battled things like depression and anxiety, but they're still moving forward, still getting up every day saying, how do I make my life a little bit better? And to me, that's true mental strength. And in my own life, I came up with the list of the 13 things, honestly, because I was struggling with all 13 of those things. Even though I was a therapist, I went through things in my life that made it difficult. And, and then my heart was broken. I was struggling so much. And I just wanted to know, okay, how do I give up the things that are going to keep me stuck in a dark place? And keeping that reminder has been helpful. Don't you think, it, you know, how we think about ourselves, the way I think about myself, I make the assumption that other people think those things about me as well, which is probably way off. And so we think that the way that the thoughts that go through our head are probably similar to what goes through everybody else's heads. We don't necessarily realize that the things that go through our head aren't what other people are thinking. When you're thinking, my gosh, I'm embarrassing myself. Nobody else in the room is thinking that. Or when you're thinking everybody's staring at me, they're probably not. And just realizing, yeah, okay, my brain lies to me. So freeing for so many people. I think this whole conversation for many people has been very freeing. Amy Morin has been my guest. She's a licensed clinical social worker and a psychotherapist. Her TED Talk on this topic of mental toughness is one of the most watched TED Talks there is, with over 22 million views. She's also host of the Very Well Mind podcast, and she is author of a book called 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. And there is a link to the book, the podcast, and the TED Talk all in the show notes. Thanks, Amy. 
Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. If the worst thing you do in a day is mispronounce a word or two, well, that's probably a pretty good day. Still, people notice when you mispronounce words, and what can happen is it can divert their attention away from what you're trying to say to the fact that you've mispronounced words. And what's interesting in English is that we don't always agree on how to pronounce a word, and there are sometimes multiple pronunciations. Well, here to sort this out and explain why this is important is Ross Petrus. He is a best-selling author and podcaster, and his latest book, along with his sister Catherine, is called You're Saying It Wrong, a pronunciation guide to the 150 most commonly mispronounced words and their tangled histories of misuse. Hi, Ross. Welcome to Something You Should Know. Hi, Mike. Glad to be here. So explain why this is important, because, you know, if somebody mispronounces a word or mispronounces a name, I mean, people mispronounce my last name frequently, and I notice it, and I notice when people mispronounce words, but, you know, it's, it's so what? Well, I mean, why? Who cares? Well, first of all, you're absolutely correct. We probably use or speak about 16,000 words a day. And of that enormous number, I, I can't believe it'd be more than one word a day that we mispronounce. So it doesn't sound that important. I don't think people should be ridiculed for mispronouncing. I think that, and I don't think, I mean, the interesting thing about language is that English doesn't have an Académie Française that says, this is how you will speak. English is constantly changing, and there tends to be a consensus around how words are, are, are understood and how they're pronounced. And that consensus can depend on where you live as well. So that's a thing in f French, that they have an academy that says this is how you'll speak? Oh, this is basically, yeah, this is the basics of the language. Grammatically, this is what you do and what you say and what you don't say. English does not have that. And so we know that a lot of words, the pronunciation of a lot of words has changed over time. So when people mispronounce words, perhaps they're just in transition. Maybe those words will soon be pronounced that way. You bet. I'm looking out the window right now, and I see birds on the grass. A thousand five hundred years ago, I would have said, I see brids on the gars. The, the, the two word, the two letters within bird and grass switched. It's called metathesis, technically. And that's a very common occurrence in language. What would you guess is the most mispronounced word today, if there is one or two or three? Wow. Now that is a tough question. Actually, let me just do a quick, can I do a quick quiz for you? It's very easy. I'm going to give you a nonsense word. Pronounce B-I-C. Bic. Pronounce B-I-C-E. Bice. Right. Isn't that interesting? That E at the end change the vowel right before the consonant into a long vowel. It basically, the E made the vowel say its name, I, I. And this goes to the word that's commonly misspoken amongst politicians, etc. It's hyperbole, H-Y-P-E-R-B-O-L-E, -E, which, you know, obviously ex excessive uh, speech. A lot of people pronounce it hyperbole. And why do they pronounce it hyperbole? For very good reasons. For those, that exact test I just gave you, B-O-L-E should be pronounced bowl, not bull. And I guess that would be my favorite word that's mispronounced because it's mispronounced for very good reasons. Well, why is it pronounced that way? Hyperbole comes from the Greek. Uh, it'd be in ancient Greek, it would be hyperbole. But it came into English and it hasn't yet had time to acquire an English gloss to it. I mean, we have the same thing, whereas, for example, let me give you another quick example. In 1740s, there was a city founded on the banks of the Mississippi by French trappers. They called it Saint Louis. It's now called St. Louis in good American English. I would never call it Saint Louis. Probably with hyperbole, it'll become hyperbole in a hundred years or so. It seems we have some words that get mispronounced I guess because we're la lazy, you know, like we say February instead of February because it takes more effort or lackadaisical instead of lackadaisical. I don't know. I guess it just comes out easier, but it's wrong, but it gets mispronounced a lot. My sister always 
used to say asterix rather than asterisk. And a lot of times those words are words that were the SK or the KS or the combination of vowel sounds or consonant sounds are kind of tricky for our, to get our tongues around. And we kind of relax a little bit, so we, we mispronounce it. So here's the thing, though. When you mispronounce it, I still know what you mean. It doesn't lose anything by the fact that you mispronounced it, so who cares? I agree to an extent, and I disagree to an extent. The key thing is, when you speak, you really want people to get the complete idea of what you're saying and to focus on what you're saying. We get thousands of inputs as we're listening to something. We not only hear words, we feel a little breeze, we hear a little bit of a noise downstairs. So the best thing to do is to focus speaking clearly. Just before we had this interview, you you had me manipulate the microphone to the optimal sound level so that I could be heard as clearly as possible. And I think it's the same thing with language, really. You want to get your point across as clearly as possible, not have people focus on a mispronounced word or whatever. Again, it's not the biggest deal in the world, but it's helpful. And to some degree, with, with, particularly with names, I think names do matter to people. People don't like it if you mispronounce their name. What's another example of a, of a mispronounced word that isn't necessarily because we're lazy, but, but something else happened that made it become so mispronounced? Okay, here's one that I mispronounced for years. It's very embarrassing. It's M-I-S-L-E-D. It's pronounced misled. A lot of people, and there was an article in the American Journal of Higher Education where a lot of scholars pronounced it misled as if it was a verb. It is not a verb. It's just the past tense of to mislead, misled. I would say misled. That's bad. Uh, you know, there was like some scholar was she was giving a speech and she said I was misled by this and people noted that, which is not a good idea. Another interesting one is it's written as victual, V-I-C-T-U-A-L. And I used to watch a show many years ago, uh, the Beverly Hillbillies, and Granny would always have vittles. It has like a Southern intonation to it. And that's the correct pronunciation. The C-T that came in came in much later, and it's still pronounced vittle, not victual. That was one of them. The other one was comptroller. It's really controller. But when these pedants in the 1500s and 1600s decided to go backwards to the origins of the word, they put the P back in. And controller, like in a, in a business thing, is not pronounced comptroller, although it a lot of times is spelled C-O-M-P. Uh, actually, I'm going to throw one other example. You were asking what a common mispronunciation is. And again, it's by good English rules is orangutan. Most people say orangutan. They add the G at the end. It's not, there's no G at the end. But English likes what are called reduplicates, ding dong, flip flop, and the last uh, consonant is usually the same. Same thing with yin yang. It's not a lot of people say yin yang, but it's not. It's yin yang. But again, English likes when you have two words like sound the same. They like the same ending. So people, for very good reasons, pronounce it badly. One of my uh, one of the ones I don't like is relator. I don't, I, there's, it's only a two syllable word and people often, even realtors say realtor. And I wonder, I wonder why. Well, that's called, that's a spelling pronunciation. They see, a, there, there's a sort of rule in English that if the uh, first, if there are two vowels, usually the first vowel takes precedence, precedence. So it's realtor. But when you look at it, they have the A at the bottom, at the, after that, and they decide, well, it's going to be real. They're looking at the spelling and then trying to pronounce it as, the, and then they hear it. Other people mispronounce it and then they hear it. My guess would be that realtor and realtor are going to be the same word and, and they're not, there's not going to be a distinction. Yeah, well, I think that's kind of almost here. But it is interesting how that, that one just particularly bothers me for, I, I don't know why, it just, it's just like, because it seems so clear to me, it's, there's no third syllable in the middle. I agree with you, but it, it's funny how that ha here, here, I'm going to ask you a question. How do you pronounce T-H-E-A-T-E-R? Say it again. Uh, like a movie, you went to a movie. Theater. Theater. 
Now, that's interesting. That's the generally accepted, correct pronunciation. I say theater, which is generally not seen as correct. And here we go again. Is that a big deal? I don't think so at all. But my sister and my wife both hate hearing me say theater. I have no idea why. So here's one that I hear a lot, too, that I don't understand, but I think may, may if, if it hasn't already become the same, oriented and orientated. Oh, now we're going into my area. I hate orientated. I just hate it. It's generally accepted. And that's one where I'm going to be like you are with theater or theater. I hear orientated and it just, it's great. So I feel like fingernails, you know, fingernails on a chalkboard, which is not a good thing if you're trying to win me over on a, uh, you know, on a business call or whatever. I hate it. You talk about, <clears throat> this surprised me, when you see the word as it is pronounced in French, papier mache, you say the correct, correct pronunciation is paper mache, but it seems like paper mache should be spelled paper mache if you want to pronounce it that way. You bet. But then again, laugh should be spelled L-A-F-F -F if you want to pronounce it that way. English no, spelling... No, no, no. And... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's not... Oh, but... Okay, we're going to argue it here. Good. Go. Papier mache is the correct spelling and pronunciation in French. L-A-F-F -F isn't correct anywhere. Th that's a very good point. You're right. What happens is that, the again, we're talking about convention. Convention in English is it's pronounced paper mache, even though it's spelled papier mache. English, what you're saying is correct with G-H, but English is very accommodative when it comes to um, alternate spellings coupled with weird pronunciations. So you're right. So one one you hear a lot is buck naked or butt, people say butt naked. And it isn't butt naked, it's buck naked. Right. That's a really interesting, uh, uh, it actually shows a linguistic change. What happens a lot of times is well, buck they think came from buckskin. And it might have been referred referring to uh, indigenous or slaves who wore buckskin and they didn't wear many clothes. But what happens a lot of times in language is that buck naked, by the time you cut to the 18, 1900s, late 1900s, it doesn't sound, we don't really think of buckskin or buck, but we do think of butt naked. Butt naked is evocative. So we think of it. So therefore it changed, it's called an acorn. It changes in a logical way to something that makes much more sense. Another one is dull as ditch water it used to be, but most of us don't see ditch water that much. So in the 1930s and 40s, it began to change to dish water. This one I, I'm always curious about because it's GIF for, you know, basically a computer image that people, people, oh. people say GIF or some people say GIF. And, Ugh. and it seems to me, I mean, I say GIF, I think when I see that word, that's what I think of. And you say it's GIF, but who's, according to who? I mean, it's, okay. it, so what? This is the problem. The person who invented the process said it's GIF. We all say GIF. What do you do? Now, we got a lot of calls on this one. And People were correct. It really is GIF, despite what the inventor said. GIF stands for Graphics Interchange Format, and it makes sense to say it's a GIF. But we, but we as humans, as a consensus, decided it was GIF. And Wilhite, the the inventor, still insists. We had like I think it was 2013. He was saying it's he was saying it's um, GIF, not GIF. But if consensus is correct, then why do you in your book say GIF is the correct pronunciation? As a, that's a good question, too. As I said, for fun, we've included words in here for fun or to show the idea of debate about a language and how words change, etc. And, you know, we both say GIF. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And we were just trying to show here what happens when people despite what you say or do, language change. Tolkien, for example, J.R. Tolkien, he pronounced his name Tolkien. Um, he's dead. And when I, I love his books and I love the movies, but I say J.R. Tolkien. I don't say Tolkien despite what he said. Were he alive and were he 
still I was talking to him, I probably would pronounce his name correctly. One word that that the correct pronunciation, I think most people wouldn't even know what you're talking about, is fort instead of forte. Forte is one of those words that seems that that is become the default correct pronunciation, even if it is technically incorrect. That's one where I always say his strength is. Let's go through that. Forte in, in music is F-O-R-T-E, and it, it's correctly pronounced forte. In, like, when you're talking about someone's strength or ability, it's, again, spelled F-O-R-T-E, and technically it should be pronounced fort. It comes from the French. It should be pronounced fort, not forte. But virtually everyone pronounces it forte. So now here you get into a dilemma if you're, this is at the very knife's edge, so to speak, or sword's edge of language change. It's changing and it's generally accepted to say forte. Now, if you go to the dictionaries, the original defin- uh, the original pronunciation would have been fort. So what do you do? On one hand, if you say fort correctly, half the room is gonna say it should be forte. If you say, well, his forte is something, the other half's gonna go, it should be fort. In that case, I would basically, if I were speaking formally or whatever, I would go for his strength is X, Y, or Z, and not say uh, fort or forte. Is regardless and irregardless, if they mean the same thing, isn't one of them unnecessary? Irregardless is unnecessary. It's generally assumed to be incorrect. But so many people say it, it's now entered the dictionary. It's really a a double negative because the I in the front makes it not regardless, which means not not regard. So it's it's incorrect even grammatically. But English has double negatives too. So I mean, you know, even though they're technically incorrect, a lot of people use them. So again, this is another case where consensus is occurring. I don't like irregardless at all. A lot of people don't mind it. And it's going to gradually, my bet would be it's coming into the language. That's the key thing, because we get calls from people, oh, you know, this is terrible. This is terrible. Problem is, despite what you think or I think, language is changing. What's a good example of, of a regional difference that, that people in one region pronounce a word one way and somewhere else they pronounce it the other way? Well, you're from California, so you would pronounce it correctly. But here on the East Coast and in the central states, we all pronounce Oregon, Oregon. And that drives Oregonians crazy. And I've heard, I went a long time ago, I went on a book tour to Oregon. And I said, I'm happy to be here in Oregon. And I've never had more corrections in my life on how to pronounce Oregon. And again, we go back to that's an interesting aspect of language change. I mean, of language. People like it when you pronounce stuff correctly. And they don't like it when you pronounce their home state or their hometown incorrectly. So I love Oregon and I hope to go back and I'm going to pronounce it correctly this time. Kind of like Louisville. Louisville, exactly. Although my favorite actually on that one is there is a river in Connecticut, T-H-A-M-E-S. And I thought I had been in London earlier and I thought it was like the Thames in London, which is T-H-A-M-E-S. But in Connecticut, the settlers came earlier when the Thames was pronounced Thames. And that little river is called the Thames in Connecticut. Isn't that cool? I didn't know that. And I grew up in Connecticut. Must have been a different part of Connecticut. That must be a pretty small river. I'll have to look it up. Hey, this has been fun, Ross. I always like talking about language because it's always changing and people have different theories and opinions and ideas of, of, of how to use it and what's correct. And it's always interesting to kind of get it all out on the table. I've been speaking with Ross Petrus. He is co-author of the book, You're Saying It Wrong, a pronunciation guide to the 150 most commonly mispronounced words and their tangled histories of misuse. And you will find a link to that book in the show notes. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ross. Okay, thanks a lot. If you're bad with names, eh, join the club. It's a pretty common problem. There is something you can do to make names stick, and that is stop talking. In social situations, we naturally jump right into a conversation with someone that we're introduced to. 
When we do that, our brains skip right over the name and right into the subject matter. So the next time you are introduced to someone, pause. Take a moment to repeat the name to yourself and let it sink in. You can even slow things down a bit more by taking a second and asking them to repeat their name. Watch their mouth, say the name out loud, and you will remember it. And that is something you should know. Which brings us to the end of this episode. I appreciate you listening and would really appreciate if you enjoyed the episode to tell someone you know and suggest they give a listen. I'm Mike Carruthers. Thanks for listening today to Something You Should Know.